Let us pray. O oh God, your word has been read and is about to be proclaimed. We ask now that you would open our hearts and minds by the power and inspiration of your Holy Spirit. Amen. I don't know if you've ever spent any time looking at epitaphs in cemeteries, but there's some really interesting epitaphs out there. There's one in Nova Scotia that says, here lies Ezekiel Akel, age 102. The good die young. Then, in one English cemetery, sometimes um, epitaphs may give you insight into marital relationships. One cemetery in England says, the children of Israel wanted bread, the good Lord sent them manna, Old Clerk Wallace wanted a wife. The devil sent him Anna. <laughs> Another. Here lies Sarah Vent. She lived 42 years with her husband and died in hopes of a better life. <laughs> a widow in Vermont wrote this epitaph on her husband's gravestone. Sacred to the memory of my husband, John Barnes, who died January 3rd, 1803. His comely young widow, age 23, has many qualifications of a good wife and yearns to be comforted. Then this is found on cemeteries, at least both in England and Georgia, maybe other places. But remember as you walk by, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, so shall you be. Remember this and follow me. Some enterprising person in England added, to follow you I'll not consent until I know which way you went. And finally, in a Thurmont, Maryland cemetery, here lies an atheist, all dressed up and no place to go. <laughs> so what happens when we die? I mean, friends, that's a question that from the beginning of civilization, people have wondered about, speculated about. I could take you through a whole course of world history and possibilities, but I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay focused on the scripture passage that Bo read earlier. Now, he set this up for you, but in case you weren't listening, although I know you were, the church at Corinth was a hot mess. I mean, they, there were church fights. They were suing one another, taking each other into the court system. They were getting drunk at the Lord's Supper. They were just not knowing how to live. What a difference it made in their lives to be a follower of Christ. And so Paul writes advice. Now we have 1 Corinthians, we have 2 Corinthians. Most scholars think there are actually a series of letters going back and forth that they were saying, what do we do about this? And Paul says, this is what you do about this. And then there'd be another letter about what do we do about these things. And, but be it as it may, they were asking for advice because they knew something wasn't quite right. Paul had made all of these promises to them about what their life would be like if they were to follow Jesus Christ, and it wasn't living, they weren't living their faith out like that. So Paul gives all this advice, and then he reminds them that the bedrock of this is who Christ is and that Christ has been raised from the dead, and that Christ being raised from the dead makes it possible for them to live a new life and to have hope for the next life. And so as so we've been journeying through the Apostles' Creed, we have reached the end of the Creed where we are focusing on, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. And this comes at the end, after we've looked at I believe in God. What does it mean to say we believe in God? What does it mean to say we believe in Jesus and in Jesus Christ being raised from the dead? What does that mean for us? I believe in the Holy Spirit at work in our lives. I believe in the church. All of these statements lead us to be able to say, 
I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Now, I have to tell you, I've told you that I can't prove without a doubt there's a God, but you, that there is a God, you can't prove that there's not one. I've told you that I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and why I believe in that, and that might and might not convince you. So it's not going to surprise you to hear me say today, I really don't understand this whole resurrection body thing. I just don't. I can tell you historically that the Greeks believed in the spirit. We died and our spirit went on. I can tell you that the Hebrews believed in a bodily resurrection, that there is a body, and that Paul seems to want to take these two ideas and put them together and say that there is a resurrection of a spiritual body. I know that the accounts of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, were not of just a spirit, that Thomas was able to put his hands in Jesus' side and feel the wound, see, touch the scars. And I know that there's more to this world and the life after than I can comprehend with my finite human senses. So I believe that there is a spiritual body, but I can't describe it to you. I've not seen one. I'm much more comfortable talking about the life everlasting, why I believe in life everlasting. But the creed addresses both of them, so I just wanted to acknowledge that up front. Paul writes about why he believes in life everlasting, and it's because of the witnesses. He names that there's Peter, that there's been James, that there have been the 12 disciples, and then he names the apostles, which I think is a little redundant, but he's on a roll. He's really upset that anybody would question whether or not the resurrection is true and that they would not understand the implications that saying the resurrection is true would have on them. He goes on to say that lastly, as one untimely born, that Jesus appeared to him, the resurrected Jesus. He mentions 500, and I think that the 500 is the only example that we don't have other verifiable outside sources. Might uncover them one day, but I will say that that may have been popular um, among Christians of the day that there was the story they were talking about. But this is the only account of Jesus appearing to a group of people. But this is the only account where it, the 500 is mentioned. But the others, the others are repeated in several different places. And I just demonstrated to you how important this is to Paul and his writing by my inability to give you a complete sentence. The reason that we have selected verses in today's reading is because Paul was so excited and going, I mean, he's repeating himself, he's breaking off, you've just got to understand this. He wants Corinth to know. His conviction stems ultimately from the fact that he had encountered the risen Jesus, but he gives others as examples of those who had. And I have to ask, one of the reasons it's compelling to me that he did see the risen Jesus is, what did he have to gain by saying that he did, by insisting? I mean, maybe it gave his message a little bit of credence, but where is all of this preaching leading him? To death doesn't seem like something you would want to stake your life on if you didn't believe that it were true. Now, why do I believe personally, other than Scripture says, that there is life everlasting? Well, not that long ago, I told you that my first year back in Tennessee at Erin United Methodist Church, I had 16 funerals, and I was present with a number of those people as they drew their last breath, and I've been present with a number of other people as they drew their last breath. And I would love to tell you that every single death is peaceful. They're not. There are times that someone is gasping and you're praying, let this be the last breath. Please, God, let my loved one be at peace. That doesn't happen all of the time. But what I have witnessed more times than I can count, and I really wish I'd kept a log, I'd never realized how important this would be, is the times that I have known 
that I was not in a hospital room or a bedroom or wherever it was, just with the person who was dying. Now, people might tell you, oh, this is a trick your brain's playing on you. Maybe, but I have been with people who have seen something, someone, have been so elated and happy and thrilled and joyful that they haven't known that I was in the room, that they wanted to be with that person. I've known people to focus on a part of the room and be oblivious to anybody else that is present. One of my early memories as a young pastor, I'm not going to say I had a savior complex, but I was there to do my job. And there was a woman who was not going to live that much longer, and I was there to pray with her friends. And I put my hand on her arm because she didn't seem to really be aware that I was there and she needed to know her pastor was there right she brushed it off like I was a mosquito or a gnat or something and I realized later it was because whatever she was experiencing I paled in comparison I had my time and place as her pastor but that wasn't it and so that's the most compelling reason for me personally to believe because I have been with people who have experienced something that I could not see, and I have felt the peace and the joy in the room. And I would not tell you that. So, what difference does it make what we believe? This is what Paul was trying to drive home to the Corinthians. Well, it changes how we live this life, and it gives us assurance and hope that there is something for us to look forward to that the pain and the darkness that we experience in this life is not all that there is. Sometimes people will say to me, I hope I'll get into heaven, or um, so-and-so is a good person, trust they got into heaven. And when I hear that, friends, my unfiltered response is, what part of Christianity do you not understand? My more charitable pastoral response is to ask myself, how have I failed you as a pastor that you are questioning this? This is a core belief of our faith. While I believe that there is a wideness to God's mercy and that God is continually reaching out to us, I believe that we can have assurance of trusting that if we have known God in this life, that that relationship is going to continue, that God loves us too much for it to end. One of my favorite sayings um, at every funeral that I preach, somewhere I weave in, that in God's love, this person's life and love never ends, because I believe that is to be true. The claim of Christianity is that we can trust that when we die, the relationship that we began with God in this life will continue, and we will experience life everlasting. Paul believed this so strongly, he wrote, So if this message that is preached says that Christ has been raised from the dead, then how can some of you say there is no resurrection of the dead? If there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been raised either. If Christ hasn't been raised, then our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. Death has been swallowed up by victory. Where is your victory, death? Where is your sting, O death? John Wesley, founder of Methodism, wrote, I am a spirit come from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf, till a few moments hence I am no more seen, I drop into an unchangeable eternity. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe and happy on that shore. Now he said, I believe God is continually reaching out to us, but friends, until we draw our last breath, if you have been baptized, then you should have this assurance that I'm talking about. Because the questions that we ask in baptism are, do you put your whole trust in Jesus Christ and promise to serve him as your Lord? Do you repent of your sin? Do you accept the freedom and power God gives you? Do you 
Um, repeating myself, just like Paul. But anyway, you, you get the point. And so I've told you before that when Martin Luther was depressed, he would touch his forehead and say, I am baptized. And what I would say to each, to remind himself that the power that was in him was greater than the power in the world. What I would say to us is when we are doubting our salvation, life everlasting, we can touch ourselves and say, I was baptized. This relationship continues. Now, is it possible to go to heaven without being baptized? Well, yes, because I believe there's a wideness to God's mercy. But if I'm talking to baptized folks, I want you to know that you can trust this. And if you haven't been baptized, then talk to one of the pastors if you think that you would like to consider taking that next step. Again, this belief not only gives us something to look forward to when we draw our last breath, but it changes how we live in the here and now, and it gives us comfort and hope. It um, sustains us and gives us courage. And I'm going to give you a quick story from three different centuries about what this looks like. We just sang, It Is Well With My Soul. Many of you know the story of Horatio Spafford, that he was a successful businessman who had lost his beloved four-year-old son to scarlet fever, and he, had, he and his wife had four daughters plus the son, and he decided that as they were all grieving, maybe they needed a change of scenery. And so he sent his wife and daughters on a ship to England so, and said that he would join them when he completed some pressing business. Well, there was a terrible collision of that ship. 200 people on board sank and drowned. All four of Horatio Spafford's daughters died. So he'd lost his son and four daughters. Only his wife survived his family, and she sent him a telegram and said that she had survived and asked him what she should do. And he did not want her to have to journey across the Atlantic by herself, and so he got on a ship and crossed over. And they went over the rough spot, you know, the Atlantic Ocean's a big place, but where his daughters drowned. And at that point, he remembered God's promises, and started pinning the words to, it is well with my soul, because he believed that in spite of the sorrow and heartbreak he had experienced, he would be reunited with his children, and that God's love endures. So that's one example. Our closing hymn today is Precious Lord, Take My Hand, one of my favorite hymns. It's written by Thomas Dorsey, this is 20th century now, who is a jazz musician who is converted to Christianity following a serious illness in 1928 that made him rethink his life, and he became a choir director, and after having written all of these jazz songs, he started writing gospel songs. They needed him at a revival, so he really didn't want to go because his wife, Nettie, was due to give birth to their first child, and but he'd made promises, so he decided to go. And while he was away, his wife, Nettie, died during childbirth, giving birth to the son. He journeyed back once he received the news, hoping and praying that his son was going to live, but his son died later that night. And Dorsey later wrote in a journal I buried Nettie and our little boy together in the same casket. Then I fell apart. For days I closeted myself. I felt that God had done me an injustice. I didn't want to serve a God anymore or write gospel songs. I just wanted to go back to the jazz world that I knew so well. If this is how God's going to treat me, I'm paraphrasing, I don't want to have anything to do with God. Some days later, one of his friends, Professor Fry, took him to a music school that had a piano and just left him. And as his fingers began to go across the piano keys, he began to play the gospel songs that had fed his soul 
And as he continued to play, the words and the lyrics to Precious Lord, Take My Hand emerged. And so it has been a hymn that has offered comfort and hope to thousands since he wrote it. A 21st century story for you from a friend of mine who marveled at the difference that faith can make during his first appointment. One of his dearly loved parishioners had been diagnosed with cancer and had a malignant tumor. When she went to the oncologist, the oncologist explained to her that they couldn't cure the cancer, but that there were treatments that would extend her life but that they would be extremely painful and they would cause disfigurement. The tumor was in her face. And the parishioner listened to the doctor and listened and said, well, I choose not to take the treatments. And the doctor was absolutely flabbergasted and said, don't you understand? If you don't take these treatments, you're going to die. And she looked at him and said, honey, I didn't come to this world to stay because she knew that she had something to look forward to. Friends, we may not think about it all the time, but none of us came to this world to stay. The question is, do we have comfort, hope, and assurance? Do we trust that there's something better in store for us? I pray that we do. And I invite you to pray with me now. Gracious and loving God, you search our hearts and our minds, and you know us. You know the questions we have, the doubts that we have, the faith that we have. You know that some of us made a commitment to you a long time ago, and we have peace and assurance. You know that some of us are going through a dark night of the soul and we are experiencing your absence. You know that there are those probably somewhere in person or online listening to this prayer who are just not quite sure what to believe. One of your followers once said, I believe help my unbelief. And so we come before you in our various places today, trusting, asking, hoping that you love us, that nothing can separate us from your love. And it really is a matter of saying, God, I believe, help my unbelief work in my heart, and help me know you and trust you. Amen. <laughs>